Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. We are going to talk today about a particular catchphrase of mine, something that I say all the time. And at the same time, we're going to address a listener question because the two things are directly related. We're going to talk about what I mean when I say relationships can be your individuation accelerator. And the listener question was about what do I do when my partner feels like I'm getting ahead of them, like I'm striving more than they are, and they feel like they'd really like me to you know, hold back a little and, and walk at the same pace that they are moving through life. What do I do about that? This is This is an issue super close to my heart because it's it comes straight out of my my own experience as well. So I felt a lot of uh, goosebumps when I got this listener question. Um, and it made me think about how you and I have had to really wrestle with this idea yes. of, of what it means to be in an individuation-oriented relationship. Yep. And it, so you approach your whole life as an individuated, individuation-oriented life. And I have come late to that concept. And now here's our relationship. And there's a whole bunch of things we can bounce off of each other and grow from and use these experiences to individuate. So let's get clear first on what we mean when we say individuate. Ah, define terms. <laughs> define terms. Ah, the scholar in me likes to. Um, So I trained in Jungian psychology, and the term individuation in Jungian psychology refers to, let me put it this simply, the process that we go through in our lives to become more and more ourselves. So you as an individual becoming more deeply aware of and embodying yourself. And I would say that's capital S self, your, your fullness, your wholeness, your, your, what you showed up, your, your unique spark that exists. It's living a soulful life. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, although I think at this point, psychology is basically my religion. So for Um, you, it's religion. (laughs) um, But this idea of individuation has been incredibly helpful to me because I, I grew up feeling out of sync and, and like I didn't quite fit into my family. And I think a lot of us do. And one of the key reasons I didn't fit in was that um, a primary message from my father was to choose the easiest path. That, that was actually an active value of his was to choose an, the easier path and um, to make his life easier. He wanted that. And he thought that that was a valuable lesson to pass on. Um, And it never worked for me. Never landed for you. It didn't work for me when I was three years old and I wanted to learn to use tools. It didn't work for me when I was a teenager and I wanted to go, I wanted a big career. I wanted to go to law school and then I wanted to go to design school. I wanted to do these big things. Didn't his, his need for things to be simpler and easier and he meant it, I believe, in a good way. He meant like, well, be easy on yourself, be easeful. But that's not how it wound up working out. Right. And so however it might have worked out, the two of you had kind of a philosophy mismatch. We did. Right? And it it left us butting heads a lot. And one of the ways that that then later played out. So when I when I was in my 30s and I... Well, as I always say, I I tossed my life into the wood chipper and hoped that it would all work out. 
what I was trying to do was move more deeply toward myself, who I, this sort of version of me that I knew could exist, but I couldn't really fully, I couldn't really explain it. It was just sort of an imagination of a direction I should head. And my father did not understand that at all. Um, it was really challenging for His him. His imagination didn't go there. It didn't. Yeah. My mom, on the other hand, had a different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the thing. Individuation is a way to, for me to understand my process, but it's a way for all of us to understand what kind of path we're on. I think that my father's path really was one of very slow incremental movement intentionally. He used to say all the time that he was done at 17. It would never have occurred to me to say something like that. And he was happy that way. So I don't begrudge him that. But my mom, on the other hand, um, she was a bit of a striver, but she was also a little unstable. So I watched these two people in a marriage. I, I'm, you know, growing up as a child and watching these two people in a marriage where one of them wants to move at a, at a steady, very slow pace, focused on ease. And one of them wants to do all the things, but also is a little unstable and a little um, Tasmanian devil-like. So <laughs> my inner imagination of how relationship works was really, there was a lot of tension in it. And surprise, surprise, I managed to recreate that for myself in my first marriage. You did, didn't you? I really did. Your imagination didn't line up. It didn't. And, uh, and my pace did not line up. Yeah. And that became, I think at the beginning, we can be mismatched with our partners and it's not, it doesn't have to feel that bad. Sometimes that feels, in fact, really, really exciting. But depending on where the mismatch is, depends on how intense that gets, yeah. how, um, how I began to feel like I was out of integrity with myself just being in my marriage. So that's stressful. It was stressful. Yeah, it's personally me. stressful. Even though I loved him and I was frequently quite happy, I didn't actually feel like I was in integrity with my, my bigger picture wants. Mm -hmm. So all that's to say... Yeah, I feel this one. But what about you? How, where does individuation and relationship, how has it played out for you? Well, um, so before I, I had a relationship with you, before I had this relationship at the beginning, I was, um, no, I, def I was self-identified as a scientist. And I thought that that meant that um, psychology was for other people. It was like a curiosity, not what I've come to find it, the vital, <laughs> the vital element to what I'm finding to be a very successful life. So before I met you, I wasn't thinking about growth that way even. So I couldn't even have this conversation. So you say, what, you know, what was it like? It wasn't like anything because I wasn't imagining into the the, the um, areas of psychological life that you are talking about just wasn't wasn't there. And then I, you and I started to talk and there were things that you just required out of your life. And I, I looked at them and I said, well, I respect you. I love you. I'm going to find out what's in them. I, this is a thing I do when other people, when people that I value do something, I will often pick it up to see what they see in it, see if I can find out what how it lines up with me. Which at times feels a little like coattail riding. Sure, but sometimes it actually just feels like real interest. Mm -hmm. That's what I well, witnessed. The thing is, you it were trying is, things on. It is real interest because I want to know more about you by finding out what it's like to do the things you do. And you were thinking about minds and souls and and psychology, so I did and found out that there was a whole realm of experience that I was missing. So then I started to engage with you. My imagination didn't include what yours did. And you showed me the possibility, so I reached for it. I was like, well, what happens? Because I like using my imagination. So I, I opened it up. 
And, you know, that leaves us here. I felt like this was a natural fit for us when I finally realized what we were doing was leading um, an individuation oriented relationship. But that was years and years into our love. And I mean, obviously we've known each other our whole lives, but also, I mean, I was, I would, I am a very practical person who happens to have decided this to study professionally, this very esoteric sort of field that (laughs) <laughs> leaves me having to use my imagination yeah. and and having to sort of dream the dream forward and I all these fluffy sayings that don't fit into <laughs> my um my practical self when you say here we are in a growth oriented relationship I remember the day when I realized that there was a there was a whole way to look at our life that that I never realized was a possibility. And that was when I was reading this book by Adolf Guggenbohl Craig called Long Live Marriage, Marriage is Dead. It's it's this wonderfully contradictory book. It was written back in the 70s by a very contradictory fellow, um, a post-Jungian. Guggenbohl Craig is known for flipping ideas on their head, really playing with the meanings of things. And he was writing about the idea that marriage is a necessity and doomed all at the same time. And I loved that idea. And I was reading this book just after you and I had decided to actually go ahead and get married. And I felt so seen. Mm -hmm. I felt so seen because what he was talking about, well, actually, it's it's a series of essays. And what he was talking about was that it doesn't have to be comfortable in order for it to work. What's it? Marriage, um, a relationship, a love. It doesn't have to be comfortable for it to be working, but it also doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to make sense to the people outside of it. And that really worked for me because we live in some other ways that are um, divergent from typical paths. We're consensually non-monogamous. We have a a larger than average family. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. So Things often don't make sense. I've homeschooled our kids. Um, I, so many ways we we diverge from like mm-hmm. the pack. And thinking about how that has allowed our relationship to be this, um, like, yeah, this process of growth and change. Mm-hmm. But also the marriage gives us this strange sense of stability. It's a little illusory. It's not real. Like well, either yeah. one of us could leave at any time. Right. Um, but there's also this this beautiful illusion of security that I that I kind of I love. I relish it. So it, even while I know it's illusory. My, I my, love that. <laughs> my mind is all a whirl right now because yes, okay, so it's illusory. But we imagine it. Right. And what's more real than the imagination? And, and then and and the way to make things real is to imagine them first and then they become real. And so. And say um, more about that. Why does, why does that sentence even make sense to you Well, as be, a scientist? Oh, as a, well, um, I mean, honestly, I just think about, so you want to build a table out of wood. You have to imagine the table so that you can start figuring out what the pieces are going to be that go into it. I mean, just like a, from a straight practical point of view, you can't build that table until you have imagined what that table is going to look like. You could even like kind of let the wood guide you. and You don't really know what the end result is, but you're still imagining a table. You've imagined how many legs it has. You've imagined, you know, what the supports are going to look like underneath it. And you just start using your imagination. If you don't do that, there will never be a table. Okay. I love this because I say all the time that your marriage or your love, your relationship can only be as good as you can imagine it to be. Yeah, right. The constraints that I placed on myself in my first marriage limited how good that marriage could be. I started foreclosing options, but I mean, I was 17 when I got engaged. I was foreclosing options all the time. And that wasn't just an ouch for me. That was an ouch for him too, for us as a couple. Uh, the 
we were trying to be something. We were trying to be a married couple. Uh, and yeah. that came with all this baggage about what it would be to be married and what it had to look like. And that left us in a place where at, yeah, I was 20 and he was 21 when we got married. And um, we painted a picture from that of what the possibility could be. Yeah. Now, I don't think we had to be doomed. We could have at any moment experienced an inspirational shift. There's always a chance of like, well, in a, a Jungian's world, right? The numinous moment, the moment when you see something beyond yourself yeah. and you can, the spark of imagination can change everything. Yep. So yes. any of you could have this moment right now Yeah. and marriage or love could transmute. It could, it could shift the, the, the imagination of it could grow bigger, could grow more complicated. And now I'm thinking about how this is related to a previous episode we did where you want an unconventional relationship or it, you have to be able to imagine beyond the, the, the script. Yes. Right. And that takes some practice. It does. And here's, so here's my question for you around all this. How aligned were your imaginations of what marriage was when you got married? Not as aligned as I think we pretended they were. How much did you talk about it? How much did you? We didn't talk about it really at all. What we did was try to control the growth, the direction. It was a little like watching somebody prune a tree. It was like we each had loppers and there's a tree in front of us and we're each pruning it, but we're not talking about the, how we're pruning it. That thing was pretty gnarly. <laughs> and that's not surprising <laughs> not. because marriage... We didn't know what we were doing. Well, and marriage is one of those things that uh, we're just supposed to know what it is. Of right. course, we don't talk about it. There's no class the culture on love tells us what it is. And we're all supposed to hear the same thing. There's no class. There's no like you don't. Come and then out we of... all grow up in these families that have a way and we imprint very, very early. Like I'm talking pre-verbal early. We start imprinting what it means to be in a relationship and then it becomes challenging to even talk about it. But right. I really, I am a huge believer, and this is what I do with my clients. We custom design relationships. I don't believe there is a standard script that works for any everybody. And I don't even think there is a standard script. I don't care what your rules around monogamy or what it are. None of that matters. What matters is, yeah, what, what did you actually set out to design? What did you do? What yeah. What is driving the yep. direction you're you're going in? And that, I think you just hit on it. Many of us really don't have the conversations that would lead us to realize that we're just living out two different scripts and trying right. to make them overlap into something that feels cohesive. Um, and th this is how my, my technical brain sees this. The culture hands us all the same template, the same imaginative template, but we all take it and do, we, we take each one of us takes and does something different with it. But then we think we're all working off the same thing. Right. So we don't talk about it. And, and we just start moving forward, assuming that we're both moving in the same direction toward the same thing. And then oh, think about really this, when you say cultural template, you're also talking about oh. actually like 17,000 cultural mm, templates yes, all laid right. on top of each other. And you're supposed to look through it all at the same, in the same direction. In <laughs> other words, every different community, every different way that you were, you know, brought up every, the, where, where you were brought up, what, what religion, what political atmosphere, uh, what race, what, what everything, every all family of this. has its own culture. Every, right. And then you yeah. try to combine them. And of course, we wind up with these these viewpoints that can feel oppositional. They can feel like they're yeah. they actually are mutually exclusive, even. And this is where we yeah. we butt heads. And one of the places where we do, and I'm going to go back to the listener question, was, what do I do if we're growing at different rates, and my partner just isn't happy about that, and really is is asking me, can you chill a little bit because that's too fast for me. I, I want to, I love you and I want to grow with you, but this is my pace. And this was a tough question for me because I am a natural striver. I myself, that like I, I am always doing the next thing. I, I'm back in grad school again, even though I already have my doctorate 
because I, yeah, I feel, pull, I just feel a magnetic pull mm -hmm. toward that. So I get it. Um, and at the same time, I'm aware of what that can, I, I'm aware of how that can cause this, um, this gap, this, yeah. this soul level gap. And so what do you, you are not a natural striver, which I don't, I in no way mean that you are lazy or anything. You're not, you are active and engaged and busy, but you don't necessarily reach the same way. Which is incidentally something you and I are working on this year because I feel some unused uh, potential and energy in me that I would like to be using in those directions. But but I not, I am not naturally right now that kind of person. It hasn't been your inclination. It hasn't been my inclination. And um, so my experience of being in a relationship with you, if that's where you're going, it sounded like maybe you had a question that you wanted to ask. Well, or... I was curious. What does it feel like for you when I have been way out ahead? Because ah, we've been in this spot. Good. Like, I mean, I went back to school um, to specifically to get my PhD. You did not get your PhD, even though you had once upon a time been in a master's program. You you got your PhD, you got your your master's degree in physics, and then I did all my coursework. Did all your coursework just... for a PhD in physics, and then it stuff didn't, changed. And stuff changed. It didn't, work. it didn't happen. So not only did you have this me striving out ahead, but in a direction that you had once longed for yourself. So I want to talk about direction. You, you've been, you've been talking about gaps and what it felt like for you to be way out ahead. Um, these are all very linear. Oh, they concepts. are. You're right. And I, I, I yeah. get why we use them and talk about um, speed and distance. And it's a, it's a metaphor we use, but it, um, it, it's not, it doesn't map all that well for, in my mind to growth because while you are striving with you know school and business and things i'm striving in other directions if other we want ways. to use a geographic uh yeah. metaphor i'm 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 using my energy in different ways um some of it to maintain the stability some of it to further the my my career, if you want to call it that, or, you know, just a whole different set of things. And okay. So and now, you, yeah, you really do. You provide a stability that our family needs. Yeah. Um, and we value both of us value. So, yeah. So if, if two people are feeling like there's a gap or that there's, a, you know, a distance, a, a speed mismatch, um, I would, uh, when that has happened with us, because you have brought it up a few times and you have complained about my speed a few times. Oh my gosh, I have. Um, and sometimes in nice ways and sometimes not. You but, move at a different but pace. But it's accurate. I, I mean, you can hear it and I talk slower. Um, I come to conclusions slower. A lot of people uh, like that about you. It's just a thing. I, I don't like or not like it anymore. I used Good. to think, oh, I should be faster. No, I should be me. Talk about individuation. This is me. Yeah. I get moving. So I have a lot of inertia. I get moving slow, but once I get moving, I move and it's hard to stop me. That's true. Right. So it's just a different, <laughs> it's hard to change my true. direction or stop me. Um, my point is that we were talking about imagination. You and I spend a lot of times uh, talking about our imaginations of the future and of the present and of how we think our lives should go, the kids' lives, our futures. Um, and so our imaginations, they don't line up 100%, but we can see them as, as we try to make it as visible to the other person as possible. And so the the pace mismatch, I, I can look at your what you're doing and I can look at what I'm doing and uh, I can see how they fit together. Mm. I'm not trying to keep up with you. I'm not you. You are growing. I'm not growing in those ways. I'm growing other ways. Sometimes maybe I'm not growing at all. I don't know. I don't um, think that's it's true. Pretty complicated, but it's pretty complicated. Because um, you can, you can grow in depth as well. Right. I can grow in place. Yeah. I don't have to move. I don't have to appear to have changed. My feelings about things might have changed in a way that I wanted them to change, but nobody else would see any difference. There's a lot of ways to grow. So we so, have a shared value of growth. Yes. And we have talked about it. 
Yeah, it's foundational. It's to foundational. Our relationship. As foundational um, as sex. So. Um, I just slipped that right in there. <laughs> oh, as foundational as sex. Yes, it is. Yep. Um, which is a pretty good individuation accelerator all by itself. Sex is. Another episode. That's a different episode. So. so um, you just said something that I think is a really actionable step. When we have gotten off pace from each other and it's been notable, mm -hmm. that's been because there's been discomfort on one or both of our parts. Like, um, okay, we're each individuals and we're growing at different paces. There's te like a tension. I'm imagining this sort of tension, this rope between the two of us, mm -hmm. right? So we're dancing and we're, and we're, you know, there's this rope pulled taut, right? As we, and what if the pace gets so off that we, we no longer are relating. What, yes, what if that's the what if the pace or the mm -hmm. direction of the dimension or the subject matter or whatever? What if one of us moves off script in a way that no longer our imaginations like can't align in some important ways? And that makes me think about a practice that we have that I, I kind of forget that we do. Um, but we talk about the what ifs, what might happen. There's a lot of time spent in our house, really just sort of um, uh, brainstorming, you know, like sharing imaginations of what might happen. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me that even though you might not be moving at a pace, you might have all these ideas and all these things you do want to do. And it looks different on you. Yeah. Right. And so, we don't have to be um we don't have to be perfectly aligned what yeah. we need to have are ways that we can come together like in in this sort of synchronicity that in this in this yep. dance where we like we fit back together we move apart we fit together we move apart we it's a it's reminding me of syncopation in music like the, it, mm -hmm. gets, it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. sound sometimes there are we're not on the same beat we're right a little off but something about it really works yep. too like it really it feels good couldn't have jazz without that right like it just feels good and that mm -hmm. that for me feels totally different from earlier relationships that i've been in where it has felt threatening to move off rhythm yeah. or off pace yep. and instead when um when you have been experiencing you know a slower or a or a less visible sort mm -hmm. of growth and i'm and i'm out wildly spinning and it's and it's just yep. it's gotten out of hand making changes and then all of a sudden something will like sort of pop in your world and we're like whoa okay um focus back over here i'm gonna look at ken and pay attention to what's going on for him and all of a sudden wow like that changes my that wildness now quiets and stills a little bit in me and now yeah. i have this opportunity to go into your world where there is a, a depth and focus that is different i can appreciate it differently um because i've had time to grow in my own way so i'm hearing in my own talk like there's a, a deep trust that we will that we will continue to find our our overlaps, yes. our rhythm together, yes. even though it's not at a predictable regulation pace. It's not, oh, I'm going two to your one even. It's not that. It's no, but I trust that we will continue to overlap in these important ways and we'll combine our imaginations in these yeah. impo important ways. And most importantly, we'll celebrate the way each other Yes, wow. it is. It is sometimes uncomfortable for me to watch you change in ways and know that I'm not changing in those ways. And that discomfort fades when I remember I'm not you. Very important fact. And I say that and it might sound silly, but I think. But I think well, we do I forget about I it. I, I spent a lot of our early relationship trying to be you. Yeah. Like living in my system. Be, yeah. Being, yeah. We and, could call it any number of things, yep. codependence yep. or, or, you know, over coupling. There's lots of things. But we I talk trust about, but, that yeah. I can be me and still relate to you and you can be you and we can still swirl around each other. And when we come together, find the overlap between our two distinct 
right? selves. And so we talk a lot about growth. And the image I use for this kind of growth is that we are two trees growing next to each other and not necessarily intertwining all the time. We're growing in ways that hopefully support our individuation, which is by nature an individual experience. Yeah. And our relationship actually supports that. It becomes part of the part of the scaffolding, part of the growing process, part of the way that we we come to know ourselves. And that's how I use my extroversion in depth psychology, another whole episode for sure. This is a really exciting topic to me. I, I love it and I'd really like to keep exploring it. So I'd like to keep talking about this, but I want to sum up where we've gotten to. I think that this is an episode that naturally leads to others. It, there are plenty but more things, yeah. At the core, we're talking about relationships as an individuation accelerator because individuation is a way that you and I have found helps us remember that we are individuals who, who genuinely want to support each other's growth. And at times that means there's going to be discomfort. And some of that discomfort comes from imagining into what might happen if we, if we aren't together. Mm -hmm. There's the fear that can sneak in, the anticipatory fear that can sneak in around the edges when we think what if what if this time we don't yeah we don't catch what if the the rhythm doesn't catch again i think that's the most precious stuff we've got it's living at that edge of the fear just being aware of the fact that we can both feel security and stability and be at the edge of growth and aware of the fact that that security is it's not a guarantee. Yeah. Secure isn't the same as guaranteed. That's right. It You can be stable and still uh, moving. It, yeah. It's just how it is. Dynamic stability instead of static stability. So you've been saying a bunch of things that... Um, you, uh, you know, so we, we, we separate and we come back together and we, and then we, you know, try to regain the rhythm and everything. And sometimes it, I, I hear it like it, it's something that is sort of out of our control, that it, it's either going to happen or not. And that's not actually true. Oh, that's a great point. We, it's not that we come back and hope we come back and we share, we talk and we, we do things specifically to get that rhythm back. It's not a guarantee that we'll get it, but we do everything we can. No. So a thing that happens all the time. I mean, yes, not no, <laughs> sorry, have it. Yes. Um, when I was in grad school, you did something for me that I never expected, not in a million years. I had no idea that this was going to happen, but going to Pacifica is like, it is putting yourself in the, the mix. Yes. The mix. Yeah, you really are, is. you're going to get psyche pounding away at you. Mm -hmm. Um, you stayed with me through that process. Every quarter, there would be two new classes all year long <laughs> for three years straight. <laughs> and that's before you get to dissertation. And what happened was every time all that material would work on me and I would be soaking in it and you chose to explore those topics. So I'd be doing a class on dream work and you were like, okay, we're talking about dreams for the next 10 weeks constantly. Yep. Why? Because that's what we're doing. And it's not that you let it take over your life, but you, you just decided, I saw you decide to engage in my stuff with me. Not every second of every day, but you would see me writing a paper and you would ask to read it and well, you'd show active interest. And that mm -hmm. left us in a spot where every single quarter, as I was deepening my experience, you were, you were coming along with me and you, it, deepened our our ability to talk about these topics the growth process that i was going through like i felt like you were along the for the ride and you you got it you understood where i was at so every single time it felt like we were getting more in tune even as my direction clearly was taking me off like and into new areas where you couldn't follow i felt like you got me and that was i saw you be so intentional about that and you might not have Yep. Um, I'm really you grateful. Were, you were growing like bamboo during that time. You were it's changing so much all the time. 
And going back to the beginning of this episode, I did that because I was curious about you. About you, you are so passionate about this. What do you see in it? I wanted to know what it was about you that was so attracted to that. And it was a way of knowing more about who you are. So and, that's how I got there. And so I, I didn't realize that I had been practicing that as well. But when we were first together, yeah, I did. I would go out in the woods with you and practice tracking because you, you liked that. And it wasn't my interest, but I did want to know about it. And it's eventually my curiosity in that area was sated. Mm -hmm. So I, so I let go. I was like, oh, that's your thing. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate you appreciating it without wanting to, to spend my time doing it. Same yep. with, um, with physics until we got back to quantum physics. And then I was back on the track and I was like, yeah, explain yep. more. Yep. Um, but the same thing happens with your work. I love mm -hmm. exploring your work. And so what happens is we come together and I, I ask you questions about the people you're working with and how, and, and then I. The aspects of my job that, that catch your that catch curiosity. My, yeah. yeah totally. And so I don't have to know about code or know about creating systems the way you do to find a way to enter your world right. a little bit. And that is an intentional practice. So we find the hooks. Yeah. We, we, I, I didn't know that, but now, now I can see it. We look for we don't just find them we look for the things that are i look for the things in you that uh, in what you're doing that i am curious about i don't pretend to be curious about something i find the things that i actually find interesting and pursue those and yeah. you do the same thing with me and that allows us to stay connected in ways that it, on the surface they might not look connected and the other thing is there is a level of trust that it's okay not to overlap you yes. know, there's a lot of variety yep. in what relationships can look like. There are people who are perfectly happy with lives that look incredibly separate, but it really satisfies them that way. It just does. And so I'll come back to what I said earlier. Your relationship can be what you imagine it to be. So if your relationship doesn't fit the script and it's the script that's pissing you off or right. pissing your partner off. Yep. You could actually get on the same team about that. Like, wait a yeah. minute. We don't like everything about that script yeah. and do something different, but do it together. Talk you, about like, you what can you like, what you don't like, figure out together. To set down a particular yeah. expectation that is, is simply being put upon you and you don't actually each value it. Yeah. So this is where having those conversations about some core values that we share mm -hmm. versus the trappings of the stuff that goes along with the values because yeah. we we come back to our foundational values and our purpose for our relationship which is individuation yep. um growth over comfort that is our core purpose and then the trappings of that yeah grad school doesn't matter writing books doesn't matter finding a new career does none of that matters yep, we, what we could take this in any direction we wanted as long as we are aligned on that purpose yeah. and it, it works out. So I would say that the, the other thing I would ask people to do is if this is an issue for you, or even if it's not, I strongly recommend that you together create a purpose statement for your relationship. Yeah. Um, I cover this cool in idea. my book, Project Relationship. There's a whole chapter on creating your purpose and an exercise to do. Um, you can grab Project Relationship, The Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love. But it's not just for entrepreneurs. It'll be relevant if you care about developing a thoughtful relationship of any kind. Um, you can grab it on Amazon. And there is, there's a section on this, finding your purpose. When you're aligned on your purpose, all the rest of it becomes easier. Yeah. Wow. I'm super, super grateful for you that we've been doing things this way. But mostly I feel lucky that I stumbled into something that let us put words yeah, to it. It it's and that uh, you've supported me in finding this path. I feel like life is so completely more full. My my experience of my own life is so much more full than it could have been without the ideas and imagination that you went out and got and brought back. Okay. I hope everybody out there goes and imagines up yeah. an absolutely custom designed love. Yep. Whatever you want. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Talk to you next week.
Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.